This story is a story of an incredible woman. And the way that her story is known is that if you walked into the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, you knew that there was something special about this woman. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that I used to visit this woman daily and sit with her. And she used to say a line of poetry. وَيَوْمَ الْوِشَاحِ مِنْ أَعَجِيبِ رَبِّنَا أَلَا إِنَّهُ مِنْ بَلْدَةِ الْكُفْرِ أَنْجَانِي and the day of the scarf, or one of the wonders of our Lord. The day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. It was on that day that He saved me from the shores of disbelief. And Aisha would hear her saying this over and over and over again, reciting this line of poetry to herself. And just like you all, she had no idea what it meant. She heard the line and she wondered, what is this woman talking about? Maybe it's a poem that she had from her tribe or from her land. And they were, of course, a poetic people. And there's a deeper meaning that I'm not understanding. So she said, one day I just asked her, I said, you know, every single time I sit with you and every time I see you, you're reciting this poem. What's your story? The story of this woman, she says, and she was an Abyssinian slave girl. She was from Abyssinia, which is modern-day northern Ethiopia. And she was a slave girl to one of the Bedouin Arab tribes before Islam. And she said that I was amongst this tribe and I had no family. I had no connection to anybody. I had no friend. I mean, she was essentially estranged. SubhanAllah, she's, well, she's living amongst these people and she's a stranger amongst them. She said, I used to serve the family of my master and I used to travel with them wherever they went and wherever they settled. And she said that one day, the daughter of the master came out and she was wearing this wishah. And wishah has a scarf in the Arabic language. It refers to a red leather, or at least in this particular situation, a red leather shawl or scarf that you would either wear on your shoulders or you would put around your waist. Traditionally, the Arabs used to put golden coins on it or some jewelry on it or something valuable on it. It was a means of beautification. And it was also a distinction, a very a, a sign of power. So the daughter of my master used to wear this wishah. And this was a particular red leather shawl or scarf that she used to put on her waist or she used to put around her neck. So one day she went to sleep. And when she went to sleep, a bird came and thought that it was a piece of meat because of its color. So the bird picked it up and flew off with it. When she woke up, she started to scream about it, that her wishah was missing, her scarf was missing. So she called out to her father and she called out to the elders of her tribe. And she said, someone took my scarf. So obviously, what did they do? They all looked at me and they all came to me and they started to interrogate me and say, what happened to her scarf? Did you take it away? Did you sell it? Are you hiding it? Where is it? They automatically assumed that she was the one to blame. So she said, I told them, I said, a bird came, grabbed it and took it away. And maybe the bird thought that it was a piece of meat. And when she said that, she said that my master said to me, couldn't you come up with a better lie than that? I mean, you could either come clean and say that you stole it or that you're hiding it or that you gave it away to somebody. But if you're going to lie, at least come up with a good lie. At least say something that makes sense. At least say that, you know, maybe she dropped it. She forgot it somewhere. Say something that makes sense. Don't make up a lie that doesn't make any sense. So she said, I said to them, I swear to you, that's exactly what happened. So she said that as I said that, they started to search me and they started to hit me and they did not spare a single part of my body except that they searched it for that wishah. And as she's standing there and feeling as she's feeling and crying for help, she said that the bird came and dropped it right in between them. When that happened, she said they all looked shocked and they looked and they saw that wishah. And she said, I screamed out to them and I said, هَذَا الَّذِي تَهَمْتُنِي بِهِ وَأَنَا مِنْهُ بَرِيْءَ This is what you accused me of and I was innocent the entire time. And she started to scream at them because it was exactly as she said that bird came back and just dropped that scarf, that wishah, right between them. When that happened, they felt so guilty for doing that to me that they freed me. So now she's in the middle of nowhere. She's a free woman. She's technically free to go. She's not an Arab. She doesn't belong to any of the tribes. And she heard about the call of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And she heard that the Prophet ﷺ, that most of his followers were from the slaves and from the weak ones and the oppressed ones. That the message of the Messenger ﷺ was one that was empowering to people like her, people that were in her situation. And so she made her way to the Prophet ﷺ and she accepted Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw her, he recognized her situation. This was not like the slaves that were becoming Muslim in Mecca, which were the the majority of the first converts, were slaves that were becoming Muslim. This was not a woman that was familiar with that land, and now they're in Medina. She was not like the young homeless man in a suffa that would sleep in the back of the masjid. She had nobody. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at her and he recognized her situation. 
When the Prophet ﷺ saw this woman in front of him that had no family, no tribe, that had a special story, and that was actually grateful to be in front of the Prophet ﷺ, and interpreted all of what happened to her as a means of pushing her to the Messenger ﷺ. Her entire life story in her mind had been interpreted as an experience to lead her to that ultimate experience of standing in front of the Prophet ﷺ and embracing Islam from the hand of the Messenger ﷺ. That's how everything was. And it made it all worth it. What does Aisha say the Prophet ﷺ started to do? He went and he built her a home inside the masjid. He put a low roof and a tent inside the masjid. A home inside the home. Ibn Hajar rahimallah remarked, he likened it to Zakaria ﷺ building the mihrab for Maryam. This was not Maryam, the mother of Isa or the daughter of Imran. This was just some Abyssinian slave girl that you know had this incredible journey to Islam. And the Messenger وسلم, went and he allotted a portion of the masjid for her. And she would stay in that portion. Now, many of you have heard the next part of the story. This was the woman that used to clean the masjid. And it was not that she was hired to do so. When she used to notice anything in the masjid, she used to go and she would pick it up and she would clean it. It was her love for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was not brought in as a slave to clean the masjid. She lived in the masjid and she would go and she would clean up anything that she saw. And the Prophet sallallahu had, a, there was a special place that that woman occupied to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he knew that Allah loved that woman. That that was one of those secret hidden gems, awliya, close friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, close friends of God that people would not look at twice. He knew that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Aisha felt compelled because if you love the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa you love those that he loves. And every time she would sit with her, she would hear her recite this poem, وَيَوْمَ الْوِشَاحِ مِنْ أَعَاجِيبِ رَبِّنَا And the day of the scarf was one of the wonders of our Lord. أَلَا إِنَّهُ مِنْ بَلْدَةِ الْكُفْرِ أَنْجَانِي Verily from the shores of disbelief he saved me. She interpreted her experience that way. And the Messenger وسلم, comes out one day and he notices that she's not present for the entire day. And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and just even actually the wording, فَقَدَهَا عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ والسلام, Literally means he missed her. He wondered where she was. He noticed it right away. It didn't take the Prophet وسلم, many days to notice that she's missing. She's not here. And so he asked Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where is that woman? And they told her, Ya Rasulullah, she died last night and she died at an odd time of the night. And subhanAllah, if you think about it, you know, this woman died in the message of the Prophet وسلم, was freed by the Prophet وسلم, had her home built by the Prophet وسلم, in the message of the Prophet وسلم, and she died at night and it was an odd time of the night. So the Sahaba thought that it was not the right time to bother the Prophet وسلم, to come and pray the janazah. So instead, they washed her and they prayed on her without waking the Messenger وسلم, up. And when the Prophet وسلم, heard that they did that he was so angry and upset and his being upset was for many reasons one of them that he wanted to pray on her and he wanted to lead her janazah another one that he understood that the sahaba did not see how valuable this woman was and who she was and they did not know about her position with allah and so he said to them take me to her grave don't you know that these graves are lit up by my prayer for them and the messenger وسلم, goes to her grave and he prays over her grave and by the way, this is the only incident that we know of in the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, of a person who had the janazah done for them twice. Once by the Sahaba and then with the Prophet وسلم, and presumably maybe another group of Sahaba with him. But he found her valuable enough to go and to pray janazah on her again, even though some, the best generation of people already pray janazah on her. I'll take the, I would have loved to have the Sahaba pray at my janazah. But the Prophet وسلم, knew that something was special about this woman and he went to her grave and he prayed for her again. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lights up the graves by the dua of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on that woman and give her the companionship of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannatul Firdaus as well as us. Allahumma ameen. The point is, dear brothers and sisters, that if you would have walked into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, would you have noticed her? Would you have thought there must be a story here? Would you have seen value? And subhanAllah, day in and day out, we see people around us that are in need. And we devalue them. Whether they're in front of us, or they're a few miles away from us, or we see them through our computer screens. And we don't take them seriously. We should not allow for the indicators of a person's value that society accepts to become our indicators of a person's value.
Do we value people by money? Do we value people because of their celebrity? SubhanAllah, when someone who's a celebrity has a minor tragedy, it's a major tragedy for everybody else. I guarantee you, they'll be okay. They'll be fine. They'll get over their bad haircut or their uh, celebrity breakup or divorce. They can cry themselves to sleep in their million dollar mansions and something else will come along for them. There are people whose experience you have not encountered. And even within our community, our mashayikh, our imams, our du'at, our activists are not more valuable as human beings as each and every single person who attends the masajid and doesn't attend the masajid, each and every single person of this ummah. We need to experience and try to encounter what's happening and not allow those indicators and those values to become our own.